sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. And once again, welcome to the Back of the Range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 179. Lots going on this week in the world of golf. PGA Tour is heading back to Torrey Pines. Jessica Corda wins at Diamond Resorts. Darren Clark with another win on the Champions Tour. And there's college golf televised on the Golf Channel in prime time. Are you kidding me? Make sure you're watching the Southwestern Invitational on Golf Channel. Lots of guys you've heard of here at the back of the range are in contention. Got my Pepperdine guys like Verzich and Mao. SMU is there. You know, that means Mac Meisner and Ali Osborne and Noah Goodwinner flying around that place. Lots of great players. It looks um, it looks nice on TV, but I've talked to a couple of the guys and they said it's brutal. It's cold. It's windy. Um, it The greens are rolling like 14. It's super tough, but um, still great to see college golf on TV. Make sure you're following this because a lot of these guys, you're going to see them on the PG Tour someday. So keep an eye on amateur golf. So I've been busy getting episodes recorded and kind of stowed away because I'm going to be on the road pretty soon. And one of the most requested amateurs to be featured on the back of the range has been Michael Thorbornson, former U.S. junior champion, freshman at Stanford. That episode is recorded, got to get it edited, and then you'll hear that one soon, as well as my fantastic conversation with Grayson Huff from Auburn. He won the Patriot All-America during the last week of 2020. Need to get that one out too. Remember, the goal is 250 episodes before the end of the year. That will happen. So I mentioned last week that I would have a special announcement to share with you all. The announcement is that I will be at the 2021 Jones Cup Invitational held at Ocean Forest Golf Club in Sea Island, Georgia. My coverage of amateur golf kicks off next month. So as you all know, the Walker Cup will be held at Seminole in May. So this might be the last chance for someone on the outside looking in to make a statement and make that final push to either get on the GB&I team or the U.S. team. An incredible field has been assembled. It's going to be a lot of fun to get back out on the road, surrounded by the best amateurs in the world. Cannot wait to get to Ocean Forest. Now, I've said it many times, make sure you're following along on all of my social media platforms, especially Instagram. The handle is the Back of the Range Podcast. And another one that you need to know is Jones Cup Invitational. I'm going to put the links to the Jones Cup in the show notes of this episode. If you liked the coverage that I provided at the Merido Amateur and at the U.S. Amateur, that's exactly what you're going to get for the Jones Cup, and hopefully a lot more. As a bit of a preview to the Jones Cup, I wanted to do something a little different. Now, I could have grabbed one of the guys that are favorites to win and maybe even tried to grab a former champion of the Jones Cup, but I thought it might be interesting to talk to the man behind the scenes that leads the dedicated staff at Ocean Forest and the Jones Cup Tournament Committee. So my guest on this special episode is John Wade, Director of Golf at Ocean Forest Golf Club. Now, at first glance, you might think that this episode is completely off-brand when it comes to the typical guests that you meet here at the back of the range. John doesn't really have an amateur career to speak of. In fact, I don't think he's ever played an amateur tournament. He didn't play college golf, you know, despite attending Old Dominion University. So how does he get bitten by the golf bug? That's the first question. And then find a way to turn it into his profession. That's question number two. Now he's the tournament director at one of the most elite national invitational tournaments. How does all this happen? Well, it's a great story. You know that's what we do around here. So we're going to dig into all those details. We're going to learn a lot about Ocean Forest, a bit of the history of the Jones Cup Invitational, and especially how it relates to the Walker Cup. Some interesting trivia around that. So let's get started with this special episode. John, you're at the back of the range. How are you? Uh, thanks for having me. I'm doing very well. This is a little bit of a unique episode here at the back of the range for, for people that are maybe new to the podcast or for people that have been listening for several years. 
a lot of the people that are featured are, uh, you know, amateurs or mid-ams or perhaps some, some younger professionals, collegiate players. And we've had a couple instructors here and there, a couple media personalities, but we're venturing into new, new territory here. Director of Golf at Ocean Forest Golf Club, and we'll definitely talk a little bit about um, some of your stops along the way that has led you to Sea Island. But, uh, but John, we're, let me get a little bit of a baseline about how you got into the game, and I'll give the listeners a little bit of a better explanation about uh, what else we're going to be talking about. But um, talk to me a little bit about how you got into the game of golf. It was not your conventional way. Um, I was a uh, basketball, baseball, track, cross-country uh, athlete in high school, um, I had a very small stint uh, right out of high school playing um, at a community college. We played in the junior college ranks, basketball. I was, I was decent. Um, you know, probably in my mind I was a lot better than what I was, but okay. uh, um, did not play golf as a kid. Um, into everything but golf. And um, once, once basketball was starting to wind down, and I knew that it was, uh, I transferred into Old Dominion University so I could finish school and, and I got a summer job at a golf course working on maintenance just because I could make a pretty good hourly wage. And, um, okay. it just so happened that, uh, the friend of mine, um, Steve Gilly, who's uh, now a superintendent out in the, um, Houston area, incredible player, uh, helped me get the job and, and we started working on the maintenance crew. So I started playing golf after work. The club would allow us to play and being competitive by nature, um, loving the, um, inner challenge of trying to improve. Um, I took to the game pretty quick and it helps when you play with individuals that, um, at least had a small stint on what is now the corn Ferry tour. Sure. They were not on that tour prior. They were making their way. They were division one, um, college golfers and then many tour players and then, and on. So, you know, I'd hit my ball, pick it up, try not to hold them up, but, you know, from a competitive standpoint started to at least get the ball around and, We'll fast forward now. I, I, I'm done with school sure. and, and I'm lost. I, I don't I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'd maintain maintain a part time job at the golf course. And my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife of of 21 years, um, told me she said, "Why don't you go down Seascape Golf Links in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina? They're looking for someone for the summer. Why don't you just get in there for the summer, live on the island, enjoy yourself? You've been going to school." And then figure out what you're going to do, when, you know, when fall comes around. I said, you know, that's not a bad idea. So I applied and got an interview. And I'm going to tell something very embarrassing on myself. Hey, hey listen, if, if it's not embarrassing for you, it's going to – I end up telling <laughs> stories that are embarrassing to me. So welcome to my world. You're doing fine, man. It's good. Yeah. So I applied for a job that, um, first of all, I had – no idea what I was applying for. I thought I was just going down to help in the golf shop and live on an island. I mean, yeah. who doesn't want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, I um, <laughs> I was applying for an assistant golf professional's job. <laughs> so I'm interviewing with one of my closest friends and mentors, a gentleman by the name of Brian Sullivan. Brian Sullivan, at one point in time, was the youngest player to ever win the North South amateur at Pinehurst. Okay. He was an all American at the university of North Carolina. He and Davis love were teammates at North Carolina and a little bit of backstory here growing up in the Southwest portion of Virginia, we would get North Carolina news. I have been a North Carolina Tar Heel fan forever. I, I, I don't ever remember not pulling for the Tar Heels. So, and then having a love for basketball, that went hand in hand. Well, he was a Tar Heel, so I'm thinking, hey, maybe, maybe this will help me. I don't know. So, I get one, two questions in. I'm like, oh, my goodness. This, I, I, I don't know how to, I, I don't even know what he's talking What do you mean, assistant golf professional? I don't even know what that is, right? Right. And, uh, and, and I'm not a very good player. And so, he quickly realizes that I'm out of my element, this, that, and the other, but he needs help because it's season. Like, it's... It's like 
going to be seasoned in Kitty Hawk in like a week, week and a half. Right. So he asked me the question that I will tell you that changed the course of my life. He said, John, I see that you've played some basketball in your life. And other than the teams that you have played for, do you have a favorite team? And I said, well, Brian, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Tar Heel fan. Then he says, Monday, 8 o'clock, I'll see you then. Wow. And that's how I got in the golf business, right there. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, cle- clearly uh, the resume just knocked him on his ass. I mean, I mean, it's clear- <laughs> I mean uh, clearly. So uh, this is funny because we, uh, we, our, our schools that uh, we're, we root for are kind of sister schools because I'm a Kansas Jayhawk. So uh, we are. Oh, very nice. So, yes. So we're right in the same. Uh, Right in the same area there. So I'm all right. Well, this is this is a great, nice beginning of people learning how, hey, um, just about anything can happen because now you are, you know, as the director of golf at Ocean Forest, and you know, you've you've gone along the way of obviously you just mentioned Old Dominion and you've had you know stints at you know Champions Retreat and Gateway Golf. Mm-hmm. You're actually down in the in the South Florida area over in Naples on the West Coast, and now that I hear about this this upbringing in the game i mean as a kid getting the best instruction and being on the driving ranges and playing junior golf and all this competitive experience you have as a junior golfer which is not true but so explain to me how you win a south florida sectional championship and over a dozen other championships when do you go from like okay i'm playing with my buddies now i kind of you know fell into this profession but at some point somebody's going to want a lesson and somebody's going to want to see you hit a shot. So when does that start for you? I didn't lack in inner confidence, um, though I would, uh, I don't necessarily show that uh, out, but inside of me, I'm very confident. And listen, playing, playing with Brian day in and day out when we would get to play, I was playing with an individual that was player of the year in the Carolina section had won every major in the Carolina section at least once. Uh, I caddy for him in the Greater Greensboro Open one time. I was I was drinking water through a fire hose. Sure. I was just getting educated. And basically what, you know, these young men that are striving for, that are learning at a very early age, I was taking a crash course in the matter of like four years. And um the golf course at um, the golf course at at Seascape Golf Links where I worked was not a, is an art wall design, and it was not an overly long golf course due to the winds that would take place. So, and it was tight. So, just out of happenstance, you had to drive the ball straight, and if the wind wasn't blowing, you could get to every par five and two. And you did not need to be long to do it. So then I'm going to tell you, I got used to making birdies. Got it. And I got used to driving in the fairway. And when you're playing with someone and you're competitive as I am, and you're feeling like you're playing pretty good and I'm around par, maybe one or two under, and he's like six under and we still have five holes to go, it just doesn't feel good. And I didn't like it. And that's what he liked about me. So we'll fast forward. So uh, very difficult decision had to be made. I was in kind of a resort pri- uh, resort public setting, if you will. Sure. And I, through Brian, through playing in tournaments in the Carolina section, started to network, started meeting other golf professionals, meeting top AMs within the, within the Carolina section. And an opportunity uh, presented itself to me to become an assistant golf professional at St. Ives Country Club in Atlanta or Duluth, which is now actually John's Creek. Great golf professional, another mentor of mine, Billy Jack, worked at Mirrorfield Village, played at Ohio State on their national championship team in 1979, was leaving Treyburn Country Club in Durham and going to uh, St. Ives in Atlanta. And um, he asked me, to come. He says, I think you'll do very well in the private sector. I think you'll get to play more golf. You've got to learn how to teach. We've got to make you more well-rounded. So he took sure. a huge interest in me and he, he great friends with Brian. So we had a nice 
collective unit that just started trying to help me. And that's, that's what it requires in this business is people to help you. When I got to Atlanta, I probably took my first true golf lesson from a gentleman by the name of Mike Purpich, who's a top 100 teacher. And he taught me a few things from the setup and the fundamental standpoint that started to change my game. Well, I had more opportunity to play in tournament golf when I got to Georgia, whether it be the assistance division or a chapter division or the section. And there's nothing that substitutes tournament golf, whether it be amateur or professional. It's just different. And, you know, just good Lord, I guess, bless me with a little bit of ability and, and, a, and a competitive spirit. And, and at the time, my wife and I did not have kids and, and she was working. So, and she knew that I was going to have long hours and, and that I wanted to spend time during my off time, practicing, hitting balls, playing golf, trying to become very well-rounded in all aspects of the golf business which in my mind includes playing. And that's very, very important to me. All of my assistants play golf. We actually have play days in your schedule. You are expected to play. Interesting. And, uh, and that's very, very important. Well, why get in the golf business? I mean, if you just like to play, you you can go make a lot of money doing other things. And, um, but, uh, have a little bit of a servant's heart, you know, put other people's feelings ahead of yours and play golf and, and it becomes a lifestyle. And, and I bought into it and I've had some success that turned into my first head professionals job, which turned in to some other opportunities and, and, um, and, and I landed kind of out of nowhere at, um, Sea Island golf club. And, um, It was kind of, it's one of those situations where I was at Champions Retreat, where they now host the women's amateur, though it did not take place when I was there. It was a single owner, a wonderful gentleman, and um, I think the world of him um, to this day. Uh, He decided to sell the club, and and, and about that time, the head professional at Sea Island Golf Club was leaving. Uh, His name is Will Hutter. He was actually going to Berkeley Hall, but he's now the director of golf at Olympic Club. And, um, I got on a short list pretty quick cause I feel like I kind of did the right things, um, throughout my time of playing golf, you know, every year, the section championship in Georgia is at sea Island and it rotates between their three golf courses over there. And, um, so anyway, I got the job and, um, here we are. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, we could probably do, uh, and I'll be, it'll probably be a boring show for the listeners, but we could probably uh, do a nice two hour show and just how I got to ocean forest, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, I, well, I, you may lose a bunch of listeners and that, I don't want that to happen. That's going to be a sequel. No, you're, you're doing great because you're doing most of the talking and they're sick of me already. So no, this is, this is fine. <laughs> you're, you're doing good. Um, no, I, I think it's interesting and I'm glad you, you hit upon how this profession you know, obviously there's there's the route of staying at the same club for 30, 40 years, but then there's also, I'm guessing it's more common these days where you kind of move around as different opportunities open up. But, uh, you know, you just mentioned Ocean Forest, and that's where you're at right now. And you're right, there are other stories we can get to at, at another time about the, 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 the winding road of your career. But how did Ocean Forest become, uh, did it present itself to you? And, and what did you know about it before you took the job yeah i think um if i could just take one step back of you course. know i have such great respect and admiration for the individuals that have been able to kind of find um, their right club and the and the club find their right professional and they be able to stay at that facility for so many years with the pgm program now in the universities i don't know that i necessarily did it the right way though i came out um, far greater than my dreams ever allowed it, me to go. But um, I felt like I needed to see different facilities, different locations to become very well-rounded. So I basically, uh, now that I look back on it, that was my PGM school. It was my graduate course after college. And, and um, that's led us to here. So I'm kind of banging my head a little bit at, um, at, at Sea Island Golf Club and, and – um, a gentleman that I just think the world of, uh, Brennan Ville, who's the director of golf, who has been at Sea Island for 22 years. Um, 
he, uh, he and I had a great conversation um, several years ago, and he said, John, you know, you're really ready to be a director of golf, and, and we're pretty close in age, and I, I don't plan on going anywhere, nor should he. Um, so an opportunity presented itself at Bayville Golf Club up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, back Hampton Roads, back 10 minutes, 15 minutes from Old Dominion University, uh, back to my home back today. Going home. It was a golf only club, 300 members, no pool, no tennis, no tea times, lunch only. And I know what you're thinking. Why in the world would anyone leave that? Um, but, um, you know, I can I went in there with an objective and, and the, and, and given an objective by the members. And quite frankly, we, we achieved that objective in far greater time than we thought. And I would be there till this day if it wasn't for ocean forest ocean forest somewhat presented itself uh i have great relationships uh with some of the members here because they're shared members of sea island golf club for the listeners that don't know ocean forest is actually on sea island right sea island golf club is actually on saint simon's island and it's all part of the golden isles of southeast georgia so there's a lot of shared members uh, between the, the club and, 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 and both clubs, if you will, and the resort that, um, that, that gives you access to play at Sea Island Golf Club. So I don't, I don't want to sound braggadocious by any means, but my name kept getting thrown around a lot. And uh, a lot of that was unbeknownst to me. And I knew – Corey Wright, who is the director of golf here, who's a great friend of mine, uh, replaced our legend within our industry, Mike Harmon, at Secession Golf Club. Incredible move for Corey. We're so happy for him. And uh, he and I never talked about me coming down here. It was more congratulations to him and et cetera. So um, I got a call kind of late, um, late in the process. And I had spoken to a few members, and they gauged my interest. And I said, look, I'm interested, but, I, you know, I'm – pretty good where I am. I'm doing really good things. I'm making a nice living and et cetera. And, and I just don't know. I, I don't know exactly the direction that ocean forest wants to go. I could see them getting a young guy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So, um, general manager called me. We had a great conversation. Um, he called me back the next day, said, Hey, I want to continue the conversation the next week. Um, I was just so happy going to be, or two weeks from now, I was going to be down on St. Simon's Island because we never sold our house, and we had renters in it that were moving out. And we came down, met with the committee, played golf. I met with the general manager. I met with the CEO of Sea Island, um, who I had found uh, out while sitting with him that he was actually a fan of mine. And he had thought of me, um, along with some others, but he had thought of me when the position came available. And one thing led to another. And then all of a sudden, in about two and a half weeks, my family moved back into the house that we never sold. The kids went right back into their bedroom, and they went right back to the school that they were attending (laughs) just a little over two years ago. So we're here. Uh, This island stuck with me now. Uh, It's meant to be. And, and I have been, I feel like I'm talking a lot about me, Dan. That's not good. We're going to cut that um, off pretty soon. I, Don't you worry. You're good. Okay, good, You're good, good. good. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, I've been overwhelmed by how welcome uh, my family and I have been, you know, coming back and, and the people reaching out and, and it's just, um, you know, if you just try to do the right thing at all times, Good things happen, and but sometimes they just don't happen. Maybe you know, within the time frame that you think are going to happen, or uh, how you might like them to happen. But we're so tickled to be back. I'm, I feel so honored to be here at Ocean Forest and, and to be at this great club and to continue um, the golf operation that it's been known for and. Um, I just, I'm giddy. It's just the only word that I can come up with. I am. It's just the truth. You can hear it in your voice. I mean, it's, and why wouldn't you? Now, I want to make sure people kind of understand a little bit about 
um, ocean forest. And this is okay. kind of common knowledge, uh, or at least common knowledge if you do a little bit of research, but, um, you know, designed by Reese Jones. And, you know, this land basically sat right there on on, on Sea Island for, for quite some time, really didn't get developed um, for for quite a long time. I mean, people would go down to the beach, have barbecues, but for, for years and years and years, nothing really happened at Ocean Forest at, or, or at, that, at the land that Ocean Forest would, would be designed on. Reese Jones designs the club and two just really incredible correlations where the first round of golf at Ocean Forest had um, President George Herbert Walker Bush, 41, played the first round of golf. And then, and then also you're awarded the Walker Cup in 2001 and it's the youngest club to ever be awarded a walker cup so now you're the director of golf at a place that has this unique history i'm guessing that's something you carry with you every single day when you're there you just um saying that has put cold chills on me again i mean i i I truly was i was i was getting goosebumps as you're reading i mean if you think about the history of the game of golf And you think about how few places have been able to host such an incredible championship and with the history that is involved, not only with the game of golf, but particularly with the um, amateur side of golf and, you know, in the, in the home state of the great Bobby Jones. And, and I don't know that I have the vocabulary to explain it. I, I, I truly don't. Um, it's incredible. Uh, and, you know, when you think of Ocean Forest, you should know that it's a national club. Our members belong to some of the greatest clubs, not only in the country, but in the world. And when they come here, a lot of them are bringing family or they're bringing guests or they're just coming to kind of escape from their from their day-to-day activities. Sure. Uh, they're coming to a place that's rich in amateur golf and rich in golf in general. You know, more times than not, people think of, when they think of Sea Island, they think of all the touring pros that live here. But there's some great amateur golf. One thing that happened to me, and I'll take you just a couple of years ago back, and, and, and I'm, I hope that I get this correct. At one point in time, when I was the head professional at Sea Island, you had four distinct individuals that were either a captain or head of an incredible golfing tournament organization. You ready? And they were either residents slash members or employees. Mike Cook, who's an instructor at Sea Island, was the Palmer Cup captain. Right. Davis Love was the Ryder Cup captain. Yep. Diana Murphy was the president of the USGA. Yep. And Spider Miller was the captain of the Walker Cup. Yep. And Ben, they were all members of these clubs down here or employees all on this little island, all at the same time. You don't see that. Yeah, you don't see that too many places. And then also, no. I, I, and then I also forgot to mention that uh, in that first foursome with President Bush was your buddy DL three from North Carolina. So when you when and, I mean, there's another one. So yeah, exactly. So it all it all came back. So you're the okay. So director of golf, and you know, I definitely want to hit upon you know kind of the reasons that we're we're touching base now is because um, you know this is kind of a lead in episode, kind of a you know preview introduction to the club, but also introduction to you know what's going to be taking place in a couple of weeks, which is the Jones Cup Invitational. So you know, just about every tournament in 2020 was affected by COVID, but the Jones cup kind of, you know, kind of skated through without too much uh, issue because it's held in February. So everything kind of shut down in mid March. So, you know, your champion uh, last year uh, was Davis Thompson. He's coming back this year to defend. And it's also a very odd year where, um, you know, it's a Walker cup year and Walker cups going to be earlier this year. It's going to be at Seminole because obviously they are closed during the summer. So we're looking at an early May U.S. Uh, or an early May Walker Cup in the United States. We have a early February Jones Cup Invitational. There really isn't much time between those two. They got to pick a team. They got to get things set and, and ready to go. 
and you've been around. I mean, this and this is your first Jones Cup as tournament director. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. You're like, yeah, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, for- I'm nervous. I'm nervous as hell. <laughs> <laughs> It's not exactly a little, this isn't a charity scramble, is it? Uh, No, it's not. You know, uh, I went through the list today, um, and it's an 84-player field, of which roughly 40, give or take a couple, are the top 100 amateurs in the world. Of the 84 that are playing, 74 or 5 are in the top 1,000 players in the world by the by the um, world amateur golf ranking system of the scratch uh, that that does carry some weight sure. you know the jones cup <clears throat> started out as a preview for the walker cup and when it first started the tournament happened on walker cup years is every other year and this tournament has just blossomed and, and and we've got to credit every committee member that's ever been involved, the membership of Ocean Forest, certainly Mr. Jones, Mr. Bill Jones, the third, for his vision to have this event, uh, Mr. Jim Stahl, USGA, um, senior, uh, amateur champion and, and, and member here at Ocean Forest, uh, just so instrumental and maintaining um, the level, uh, uh, quality of players that have come through. And, and, and the list is in, impressive. Just just about every winner um, that has taken place, minus maybe two or three, or quite frankly, currently on the PGA Tour right now. And, and um, it, just, it just speaks to, um, to the quality. And to your point with the Walker Cup being – so early and with the pandemic taking place um, I believe like golf in general this tournament has benefited from that pandemic and that these these young men are trying to gain valuable points and this I, this may be the last point uh, major that they can get I, that I'm not sure I'm still learning a lot yeah. about that uh, but I know it's going to, I know it carries a lot of weight and, um, and, um, especially being that, you know, the membership, uh, here at Ocean Forest has had former Walker cup players or captains that are members here and, uh, and, uh, are involved uh, in the high level amateur golf. So, um, you know, everything just goes hand in hand. It just, it just, it just, it just fits so nicely, uh, together, um, it really sets it up where it really the, the spotlight of amateur golf is, you know, I mean, obviously big national invitationals, you get the spotlight, but really there's a huge one on the Jones Cup. So you mentioned the list of, cha- I mean, you have, you know, Patrick Reed and Justin Thomas, Corey Connors, Austin Connell. I mean, down the list as far, you know, Akshay yeah. wins in 2019, you got Davis coming back to defend. I- I'm just kind of curious for players maybe that haven't seen Ocean Forest, and I know you can really kind of, um, talk about the the history of the club but as someone that maybe is coming into play it for the first time what uh, what can they expect from from ocean forest in february the the running kind of joke is um, when the jones cup comes it's going to drop from its typical average of 60 some degrees and sunny uh here at saint at sea island it's going to go to about 45 and blowing out of the north about as hard as it can blow and and they'll start questioning why in the world they would even want to play this game. But uh, that's, um, you know, like, like the old saying is, if you want some adverse conditions, have a golf tournament. You know, it is a challenge. It, the golf course is difficult uh, from the tees of which these young men play. Uh, they are challenged throughout the bag. Um, there are dog leg rights holes, dog leg left holes. Um, you've got to hit proper second shots. And, and in this particular, um, uh, golf course, uh, which I think is somewhat consistent with Reese Jones designs, the miss is going to be short front when you get pin high or beyond the pin and you're having to chip, more times than not, you're going to be chipping where the green runs away from you. Sure. So it's going to be difficult to stop. So, you know, a premium on their ball striking, um, I believe, is um, 
is is where it is. Now, Davis Thompson last year, last day, winds died down, sun comes out, gets near sixty, shoots sixty five. It can happen. Right. I mean, this is also a golf course that when you have control over your golf ball, the greens are so pure and roll so good to just get them online, it's going to go in. Uh, but what, what you just don't want is to have those downhill and side hill type putts where you're having, for lack of better words, being somewhat defensive sure. so that the ball doesn't get away from you. But uh, uh, you can have a very good score here. And Davis broke the tournament record, the course competitive record last year in the final round. And um, it's a credit to him. And, um, and it's... Um, They'll see a lot of 480-yard par fours too, oh, gosh. Which, which I guess now is kind of a shorter par four. Yeah, you know? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I'm, I'm saying 480 par four, but some of these guys, you right. know, if, as long as you're not, you know, hitting it into the fan, I mean, some of these guys, that's that's a that's a driver, you know, seven iron, eight iron. I mean, it really is. Yeah. So it is. Um, and uh, now this is a little bit. I would say it's on topic, but I, and I'm not sure if this is something that you can kind of speak to because I know you're just now getting into running the Jones Cup. But I'd kind of like to have listeners walk away from something and learning something uh, specific. And you know, sharing these great stories about your career, and we're talking a lot about Ocean Forest. But you know, I have a lot of parents that listen to the podcast, a lot of juniors, and you know because of the uniqueness of this episode, you know, you and your tournament committee are in some respect, you're really gatekeepers to one of the elite amateur tournaments in the country. And, you know, I know there's certain, you know, people, like you said, you know, wagger and you're going to get in based on certain uh, qualifications, but um, you know, and, and let's just make sure everyone understands the field is closed for this year. So nobody called, you know, John or me and asking him to get into the tournament, but I'm curious, you know, a lot of these young guys, you know, they play well in a tournament like the Jones Cup or, or Sunny Hanna or Western or whatever, man, that could really leapfrog them into maybe getting a college scholarship or getting them all sorts of opportunities. How do you deal with, you know, people asking to get into an elite amateur tournament? What do you, what can you maybe share with someone that is maybe on the cusp of getting in, but not quite? How do they improve their chances? The right way, I should say. You know, no, we're not, yeah. you know, don't don't Venmo me or Venmo John or no cash. But I'm saying, right, what's right, right, right. You know, um, uh, I'll go a little bit old school here on you. No, um, man. good good play takes care of it. Yeah, you know, play better. Uh, I, that that sometimes can come off just a little bit harsh, but play better, and 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 you're going to doors are going to open. Um, to the victor goes the spoils, as they like to say. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things that the committee looks at um, and, and and considers um, heavily. Uh, number one is if you finished in the top twenty the previous year. Okay, uh, that carries uh, some weight. Um, if you are on the watch list for the GBNI Walker Cup squad or the United States squad. Okay, uh, NCAA championship, North South amateur, Northeast amateur, the players, Porter Cup, Southeast, Southern, Sunny Hanna, US Am, US Junior, US Mid Am, Western Am, Western Junior, and then the AJGA. Um, kind of the rankings of, of, of where you're falling on these ranks. So, you know, you're, you're looking at players that have been playing. Um, a lot of tournaments and have played well in a lot of tournaments. Um, that is really how you become um, noticeable to the committee. Uh, when they're seeing your name playing well in these events um, or you're finishing very high and, and, and the Walker cup uh, committee is starting to look at you um, again. Remember this was originally a Walker cup preview, but has now turned into just one of the best amateur uh, tournaments in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And I know I'm biased, but sure. I, I do believe that. So playing well is really how you get the invite um, just because, and, and this, I think this is where it gets difficult then because 
just because you know someone that knows someone and you really got a lot of promise and you are a good player. I mean, think about this. I mean, how about, how about if you were 125th in the world, but we can only take 84. Right. I, that, golly, I, that, that, that makes it difficult for the committee. So that's why I give the answer. You know, you got to play well, you, play well. you know, <laughs> you, I mean, you just do. Uh, it's, it, it's a, sometimes can be a hard lesson in life. With that being said, and, and this is where I'm, I'm, probably letting uh, too much of me be known, but I love the story of the individual just getting the opportunity and seizing the opportunity because I got a break in my profession and you want that. So the committee does look at individuals that are teetering, you know, they're like, they're teetering, and they, you just feel like you need a break. Right. So there's a little bit of a human side to that as well. Yeah, no, that's that's great because I know, and you know the other, and this is a much longer discussion, but you know, there the other thing too is that you know that there's tons of players that that are great locally that maybe for whatever reason they they can't travel. You know, maybe you know five right. six. Yeah, they just can't do it, and those are the tournaments that have the points. And they just, they're not able to do it. So it's, and that's another, yeah. that's a whole other conversation, but I'm glad you kind of showed that. And plus you also have an open qualifier. So you do have a, a qualifier for, and you give. We do have a qualifier and that's, yeah. and that's, you know, and, and listen, you have to play well in the qualifier. We just yeah. had that this past Monday. Um, two under got in a playoff. Uh, we awarded three spots. Um, our um, top qualifier shot five under. Uh, we had a three under, and then we had three play for one. And uh, a young man birdied um, the first playoff hole, and he gets in. Uh, so we we feel like the qualifier is important for those type stories right. and, and for those individuals that are just teetering, that just haven't quite played the way that they wanted to uh, in the past, and 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 you know they kind of earn it the old school, you know, the old school ways just to earn it. And, um, and, you know, we want those qualifiers to play well. And, you know, I want to touch on one little thing about you talking about parents getting in and this is going to, again, echo playing well, the Jones cup junior champion gets a spot in the Jones cup. And, uh, that Jones cup junior came about from the Jones cup. The winner of the Jones Cup gets a spot in the RSM Classic, yes, the PGA Tour event. So you can see how this starts to snowball by simply, and it's so easy, it just rolls off your tongue. Just play better. I mean, yep. who, I mean, we can all just, you know, and I know both. It's a lot harder than that. But, of course. Um, yeah. Now, who is now trivia question here? I know, I know the answer. You probably do too. Who is the only person to win both the Jones Cup Junior and the Jones Cup Invitational? Oh, you are really challenging me. I mean, who is the only player to win them both? He's in, and he's in your field this year. I think it's Garrett Barber. There you go. There you yeah, go. Yeah, I think it's. I was trying to do that by by memory. Jesus, you didn't, I didn't know I was going to be put on the spot. Well, like that. I mean, My you know, word. I mean, this is you know the back and forth here a little bit. I ah, mean, well, the test. That's all. I well, know. I'm I'm a little salty because I just realized I'm not getting an invite to the Jones Cup this year to play. <laughs> so I just it just kind of all this song and dance about all these top one hundred and thousand. I realized yeah. Yeah, it's not. I'm not going to make it. So all right. So let's. Um, I, I want to. There's another thing I wanted to touch upon before we we kind of wrap this up, but. Um, the amateurs and the, the these guys that are getting ready to play, they are basically trying to peak for this one, uh, you know, these these four days, or I'm sorry, three days. It's 54 whole term, but basically they're trying to peak for this special week at, at Ocean Forest for the Jones Cup. And uh, I'm guessing that the golf course itself is trying to peak. And, you know, obviously this is your first go around at the Jones Cup, but I'm sure in your history at all these different uh, clubs that you've worked at, You've run just about every type of tournament imaginable, whether it's a member guest or a member member or, or team matches, whatever you want to call it. You've done it all. How early does it start for you or did it start for you to say, okay, it's time for Jones Cup? So 
I'll, I'll reference the golf course first. You know, the, I would tell you that this golf course, we start um, making preparations in the fall, um, October-ish, November. Being in the geographic location that we are, we're, we're like teetering. Do you oversee, do you not oversee the Bermuda? Um, are we going to have a good winter? Because, you know, it can, it can hover around 60 most, most days down here in the winter and then gets warmer in the summer. Do, do you not? Decision was made several years ago, many years ago. We just need to oversee the golf course because our biggest play with our membership is – Really, we're a national club at spring and fall. We're a little we're a little slow in the summer, right. and we're a little slow this time building up till about March, January and February. It's just kind of it's kind of quiet, and 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 the few members that have the ability to kind of travel when they want are down here, and and then the few that live here full time. So that so the preparation begins with the overseed in the fall. Now. We really have ramped it into high gear uh, right after the new year. Um, you know, doing those, making sure the out of play areas are where they need to be, that type of thing. The golf course, day in, day out, quite frankly, is is just it's tournament ready now. Um, that a lot of it depends on the weather and the moisture in the air in terms of firm and 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 fast. But from a condition standpoint, we're not growing up the rough, you know, just for the tournament and then cutting because right. we want you, to, we want the listeners to know we've got member play before and after. So uh, we might as well just make it tournament ready day in, day out. And then this is our standard operating procedure. And this, this is what we would consider our standard day in, day out. So, um, that gets prepared in terms of the operation for the committee. Um, probably not the best year for me being that I'm four months in, but I will start working on this for 2022 in April. Um, I will start every year. The Southeast conference championship is played on the seaside course. I will go over and make sure that I introduce myself to the coaches and that they have a, a name and a face and because, you know, the number of young men that play for those universities are going to be involved. Sure. I will be much more um, in tune with the amateurs throughout the – amateur tournaments throughout the year of who's doing what, making notes, because I'm, I'm a big believer in, in – in, getting way ahead i i I almost like to be over prepared and um as you can imagine just starting four months ago um i'm i've I've already got a few nights where i'm like oh man have i done this have i done that do i have time to do this that type of thing but so that's that's kind of our preparation uh, if you will look a credit a credit to the um to the committee uh here at ocean forest it's membership and stuff it the blueprint is, is laid out. It's just that we need to follow that blueprint and then try to enhance where appropriate. Nothing's broken. It's very successful. Nice, so, nice place to be but, in, isn't it? Exactly. It, all we want to do is, okay, how do, we get just, how do we get better this year than last year? And we'll do the same thing in 2022. How do we improve 2021? You know, for because we we really want these young men to walk away from here going, you know, that was an incredible tournament, but that staff and membership made me feel as if I was the most important player in the world. That's very important to us as well. Right. Is their their experience? We want them to have an incredible golf experience in an incredible amateur tournament that has some significance to it, whether it you finish first or whether you finish fifth or 10th. So it's, it's great that you bring that up because, uh, you know, I've played in, in quite a few amateur tournaments down here in South Florida, and I'm obviously not going to drop names of clubs, but you know, this isn't going to be a shock to you. You know, that sometimes the outside tournaments that come into a private club, 
Yeah, you, sometimes you get the feel that that you know you're welcomed with open arms, and then other times you realize that they want you out of there as quickly as possible. So I'm glad you talked about how important it is for the players to feel welcome, and you've talked about the membership here and there. I can't let you go without you giving me a story. I mean, I know you're only four months in, but it's probably impossible for you to to mention, you know, by name all the different members that have helped you along the way get, you know, acclimated to Ocean Forest. But there's always that one member at every club that everyone's got a story about. Can you share maybe give me a good member story? Wow, a good member story. I I, I tell you, um this isn't a great story, but it but it has it, it, it has happened um, since I've been here. Um, did a real quick little um, two-day getaway to Congaree um, up in South Carolina, yeah. and took uh, went with seven members up there to play golf. And one of our members had a hole in one, and the ball goes in, and he just kind of walks up to the cart and puts it in. Everybody in the groups jumping up and down, sure. and, you know, like, you know, and then this particular members, members, some really, really nice clubs in our country, Northeast and Southeast. And um, gotcha. <laughs> I think, I think everyone and, knows um, what you're talking about. I love yeah, it. And, uh, <laughs> puts the club and he kind of turns around and like, yeah, it's not a big deal. Oh, yeah, that's a great shot. Whatever. Blah, blah. And I, I looked right at him and I said, how many? He goes, it's my seventh one. <laughs> <laughs> seventh one? Yeah, it's not that big of a deal. Hey, would you mind grabbing that ball when you guys go up to the Wow. To the hole? That, guy's <laughs> <You know? laughs> that guy's got stones, man. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay. And, and this guy's the most humble guy in the world. Uh-huh. You know, he didn't want any – he didn't want any – didn't want a fan fanfare, fanfare or anything like that, you know. I, look, I, what do you guys aim at? I aim at the hole. I don't know what you guys aim at. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you got to bring it down to the lowest common denominator. It's like, yeah, just, just aim at the hole, dummy. So, uh, exactly, that's exactly right. Wow. Um, all right, so John, we're, uh, we're this is perfect. I'm trying to think of what else uh, we can. I was going to add now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you mention that you ran the the Jones Cup Junior and the Senior while you're at Sea Island? Is that right or no? Yeah, that that is correct. I, I was the tournament chairman. Um, I did not start those. Um, right, right. I, no, I know I, that. I, I, yeah, I, I inherited those, and um, much like what the Jones Cup uh, has done over the over the last few years, the level of play uh, and ranking of the players has um increased every year and it is just it's just unbelievable to to watch but um it's something that i'm gonna say we the team i mean we at all of sea island you you know goes back to how do we improve and how do we get better players and that and and it's it, it is morphing into something so incredibly special i was talking to the professional staff over there uh on Monday when we host our qualifier on the plantation course, which Davis and Mark Love had, had, had redone, um, I guess now two years ago. And um, one of the professionals told me that the Jones Cup senior, which takes place every March, when they sent out the initial link to say, hey, registration is open, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think within 72 hours they had over 175 entries. Gosh. So now, to what we've been talking about, all right, well, now all of a sudden, what do you do? Well, well, you got to go to the rankings. Did the guy win the U.S. Senior Am? Did he win the the Mid-Am? Has he played in USGA stuff? Because this is a nod and an honor uh, to amateur golf and and amateur golf at a high level. And, um, you know, this whole area – embraces it you know you're talking a little bit about clubs not wanting i understand that i I understand that members uh, that are paying dues and now all of a sudden you you block this thing off it ends up being four or five days and uh, they cannot play I, i think timing of an event is very important so the timing of this event at ocean forest 
Um, though there have been countless ideas, do you move the van? Would it be better here? Would it be better there? And it, whatever part of the calendar you're looking at, from from a member's perspective, I think it falls at a beautiful time. Um, you do wish that you could get every single player, but it, it conflicts with a couple of college events. Sure. But due to the pandemic, that's helped us this year. Number two, the members what is interesting about and unique to our area, the members here completely embrace housing the players if they need housing. So now what has happened is you have the player and the member that have developed relationships in that if that player does end up going on to play the tour, they end up staying with them during the RSM. There you go. It's like they've become one of the family. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and from time to time, you will, you will have a player that will be just traveling by uh, that will stop, and one of the members will call and say, hey, I'm, I'm bringing out so-and-so. You know, if you, if you recall, he played in three Jones Cups, you know, whatever, they, and, and stayed with us. And uh, it's um, – it's it's really cool, and I think it's something that that just enhances the event to another level. And it, because you got to have buy-in, you know, right. to to run an event at this level with this quality of players, we've got to have a hundred percent buy-in. Yep. We, we, you can't you can't go in there at fifty percent. Yep. It's just not going to work. Yeah, and the players so. have to feel welcome. I mean, they they have to be able to go in there and and have a meal, and re, and have members you know slap them on the back and congratulate them and make them feel welcome so they can get the most out of their their game and the experience. Um, tough question to end the episode on. You've been a tournament director, been on the committee for the Jones Cup Junior and the Jones Cup Senior, so both ends of the spectrum here. Who has more fun at Ocean Forest, the kids or the or the old guys? Well, you know, <laughs> man, I could give you such a political answer right now. We don't do uh, that. we don't do that here. We don't. Do that I here. know you're want you're wanting a hard you're wanting a hard fact answer. Um, I mean, I think I, I know what the answer is. I mean, I yeah, know, I, I know how yeah. I'd answer it. Listen, I. You're going to have to accept this answer. Okay. Every one of them. Okay. Every one of them. Because it's unique. You know, the juniors over at Sea Island uh, Golf Club, you know, they're they're just hungry, man. They're trying to get to that next level, right, man. They're right. trying they're trying to get into the Jones Cup, you know. So they get over there. They're wanting to see the Performance Center, maybe meet Randy Myers, maybe maybe see a guy that plays a tour, and, and they're, they're – they're, trying to build their resume so that they can get into college and play golf. Right. And then the Jones cup, I'm not so sure uh, that that's just, it's really a lot of Walker cup trying to really get a good point base to get into another high level um, golf tournaments and amateur golf tournaments and, and compete maybe early in the year before their college season or their mid amateur season really gets going, maybe take an assessment of where they are, but, but hopefully play well and maybe get into the RSM classic. And then the seniors, man, they've got it made. They're they're down here. They're just enjoying themselves. They're staying at the hotel, you know, they're, they're like, playing you know a tee up they're not having to they're not having to play all the way back and and, but it's competitive i mean it is it's just it's just incredible to see the golf that comes through this area and it's 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 incredible to be a part of it and and i am so i'm gonna use the word giddy again i am so giddy about being a part of an incredible event that was started, you know, 20 years ago now, I guess. And, and, and to know, to know that here we are 20 years later, what this has turned into the people before me, the Corey Wrights of the world, the Andrew Shucks of the world that were the professionals here. And Dan Hogan, I believe was before Andrew to to know that they were involved and, and to be a part of that is, it's overwhelming. Uh, you know, I don't know that I deserve it, but I am going to try my hardest to just keep 
improving and, and maintaining what they've started. And, and and I really hope that the players that come to to the Jones Cup here in, in early February 2021, I, I hope they really feel the sense of, of belonging here. And, and I want them to feel like they're members here for their time here. And, and, and I want them to, to walk away here just wild and, 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 and know that, you know, even if I didn't play well, what a great experience. That's very important to me. Well, John, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time and really educating, um, you know, the listeners uh, about the Jones Cup, about the trajectory of your incredible career. I, 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 I can't think of a, a more perfect person to kind of, uh, you know, take the reins of, of what's, ever, you know, of the Jones Cup and everything that's happening in Ocean Forest. So uh, Jones Cup is, um, you know, we'll put the link to the website in the show notes of this episode and the uh, the term is february 4th to the 7th appreciate the time and we'll uh, we'll have to catch up again and i appreciate you stopping by the back of the range joy being on your show thank you for your coverage of of not only the jones cup but for amateur golf uh as well and there you have it special thanks to john wade for joining me on this episode here at the back of the range As I said before, I will be at the Jones Cup Invitational. Mark your calendar February 4th to the 7th. Make sure you're following along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Check out the show notes for some more links to that tournament. And we'll see you again next time here at the back of the range.